Hello there, everybody. Thank you Hello. so much for joining us. Michael here. Yeah, Rupert here. Yeah, Raring coming to go. up, we've got 13,000-year-old buildings in Turkey, elite burial in Bronze Age Hungary, abandoned copper mines in Israel, oldest man-made structures in North America, our special guest, Duncan Garrow. Yeah, we haven't had Duncan uh, on for a, uh, for quite a while, so it's uh, going to be good to see him. Yeah, <clears throat> and we ask if um, Irish mythology has anything to teach us. So a lot to get through this evening, as ever. Uh, but first, mm. huge big thank you to um, our uh, Patreon supporters, who many of you, as per usual, I can see uh, in the chat and having a. Uh, a very jolly time, you know. This is this is a case of. Uh, but first, a word from our sponsors, because yes. uh, we certainly couldn't uh, do what we do uh, without them. <clears throat> Here's the thing, though: if you've ever watched any of our shows, or if you, even if you come to the end of this one, if you get that far, if you even if you've watched any of our shows and you wondered to yourself. My goodness, those guys do a good job. I wonder how I could support them doing doing more. Well, here's the answer. Um, there's a link in the description below to our Patreon page. Um, it doesn't cost much you know, to subscribe to us and, uh, uh, and help us do what we do. More news on stuff, more stuff we'll be doing later on. Um, but the point about Patreon is it's a wonderful community, as you can probably see from the you know the the good people that are here in the chat already. Um, and <clears throat> we've got numerous ongoing projects. And what you get, you know, being a mem a Patreon member, uh, is getting on the inside track, um, getting first hand, uh, you know, what we're up to uh, and the process and the behind the scenes stuff. Not only that. <clears throat> But you only you you get your own oh your very own weekly podcast called the Monday Moot, um, which isn't available to anybody anybody else. Um, do you know we're coming up to the the next Monday Moot will be the fiftieth, Rupert. Yeah, uh, it'll be the fiftieth Monday Moot, and uh, 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 do you know what? Forgive me, whoever it was that pointed this out that uh, we actually did sixty four four of the Monday megaliths before that. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, that's so very true uh, indeed. We will be romping past that milestone mm. with the Monday moot. We just couldn't think of any more megaliths, that was it. <laughs> we'll have to uh, we'll have to dream up something special for the uh, the next Monday uh, moot. Andy, it's um well you can uh, just $1 a month uh, will um get you subscribing but doesn't open up everything five dollars a month gets you pretty much everything uh, that we ha mm. have to offer that's all that's all uh on a monthly basis there is another way yeah. if you don't you know don't fancy the idea of subscription also down in the description below is a link to our um buy me a coffee uh, campaign which goes into a um a ring fenced um sort of fund for film production for our film production more of that in a moment because we need to change the buy me a coffee campaign thing or whatever but we'll tell you about that uh, <clears throat> what's happening in that direction in a moment sorry Rupert, Hello, you to say something? Uh, no i was just going to say i apologize for this but i have just uh, realized that i have not 4g'd myself up and uh, so so <laughs> so pardon me if I go silent for 10 seconds, um, yeah. uh, talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and that isn't a euphemism, folks. <laughs> when he says, I'm going away to 4G myself up, uh, no, he's come in on his ordinary Wi-Fi now. See, it's gone horribly blurry, and uh, I'm sure when he connects, it'll be fine again. Um <clears throat> I think uh, that was what I was going to say for the moment. So, you know, uh, we look forward to seeing as many of you as we can uh, on uh, on Patreon. We have a very jolly time. Welcome back. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Anything um, else you want to say about uh, Patreon that I may have missed? Oh, I mean, there's loads we could 
talk all evening about uh, about that. But um, um, that's well, it's it. just that there's in, uh, it's there's just uh, easier access to us if you want to chat with us and things like that. Yeah, um, yeah, we're, yeah. we're always accessible. Did you mention the uh, monthly live as well? No, I forgot about the monthly live. Yes, yeah, we do, we a, do monthly... a monthly live broadcast, uh, which is um, it's actually a Zoom, so it's a bit like yeah. a party, really. We all get yeah, together and more of a, uh, more of a uh, chat, you know, yeah, mm. with, with uh, which is really nice. Yeah, it's sort of more one on one. Well, it's not one on one, but you know what I mean. One on one when there's two of us, one to one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you yeah. get the idea. <clears throat> Um, um, anyway, enough of uh, enough of that. Um, do you know what I want to do now, Rupert? You know, before we m move on, because we're going to be talking on. about Ireland later on. Mm -hmm. You know, and what we what we brought back. I've just thrown together a little two minutes. Yeah, film. it's very rough indeed, uh, and it's made up of sing a single shot of each individual site that we visited during our tour. Those of you who don't know, we've just been on a tour of uh, of Ireland with a group of uh, people. How many patrons? Are... Oh, I'm getting confused by four. the number of pa four. And Definitely we met four. up with two. Uh, uh, yeah. <clears throat> uh, yes, met uh, on, up with two, on, on, two in the field and four yeah. who were on the tour. It was fantastic. Yeah. yeah. But we we did a, a, a 10, what was it, 12 day tour of. Uh, uh, of Ireland and the test as we watch this uh, movie together is because it's a whistle stop tour um, it is for us to remember exact what each site is okay you're ready for this Rupert yeah it's a test of mem memory <laughs> test ready as I'll ever be we might too many fall over moments completely. in my life I'll tell you yeah <laughs> all right all right here we are whistle stop tour of Ireland by site going now there we go let's start uh, well, off in Dublin well that's the museum in Dublin <laughs> Yeah. Nah, it... Labakali. Labakali, Wedge Tomb. Yeah. Is it, we, it is Wedge Tomb, isn't it? And this I can't uh, remember. That's uh, uh, Knock Row. Oh, well done. Yeah. Uh, th that is a not so well known site and needs visiting. Uh, Gorain Stone, Gorain Stone Road. Drombeg. Drombeg. Yeah, and um, so far we've been down in the south. Oh, and this is in the south oh. as well. Lovely place, sort of fairy ring, covered in ferns. It was. <clears throat> That's uh, the Grange Stone Circle. What's that one? Yeah, uh, part of the Lofgur complex, the largest stone circle in Ireland. We didn't know. Who knew? No, amazing. Uh, no marks for recognising Pulnebrone there, and uh, Mark Mabinia. Uh, very important from a genetic point of view. Creevy Keel, love Creevy Keel. Keel. <clears throat> Court Tomb in Sligo. We're, on, we're in Sligo now. And this is part of the uh, Caramore Megalithic Cemetery. It's a huge cairn called Listergill. And that, of course, is Maeve's Cairn. Yeah. <clears throat> that is the only shot of us wandering through the fields of um, Rathcrogan. And where's this, Rupert? Oh, this is spectacular. Uh, uh, yes, that's. Um uh, Loft Crew, isn't it? Not, uh, yeah, Loft Crew. Yeah, yeah. Loft Crew. Loft Crew cans. One of the cans in Loft Crew. You know, that's a complex. Uh, now I really can't remember. It was, uh, that's it's up another on the, of the cans at Loft Crew, isn't it? No, no, no. Isn't it's it? up in the ring. Up in the ring of. Um, oh, yes, Gully. As well as um, was this. There's, yeah, uh, there's that. Rick, Hoser. <laughs> <laughs> um, as was this one. Place in the quiet um, place in the woods. That's, that's not what it's called, uh, though. However, we can remember Island. that's that Dalf one? with that great gouge out uh, from the excavations. Nalf. <clears throat> and. Astonishing, isn't it? New Grange. Yes, the external monstrosity. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, missed a few out there. Yeah, our brains aren't quite as functional as we thought they were. No, and I here... mean there were pictures of uh, 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 you, uh, unless unless I blinked, uh, there was Browns Hill Dolman. Yes, well, the that's you're absolutely right. Don't know how that got missed out. Anyway, Castle Rubbery. 
There we finish on uh, uh, the hill of Hill of Tara. Tara. Yeah. Uh, with uh, anybody, I expect one or two of you may have recognised um, <clears throat> Anthony Murphy there, giving forth about myth and uh, and the hill. Our of Tara very good there. friend Anthony, who what he doesn't know about Irish yeah. mythology. <laughs> yeah. mm. uh, th Dorman, thank you for reminding me to watch my head. Yeah. Did you spot yourself, <laughs> uh, Simon? <laughs> anyway, yeah. so that's a little teaser. We're going back to Ireland to talk about um, stuff later on. Mm. Um, I think and it has that's... to be said, we're going back next year as well. Um, oh, yes. Uh, the... Uh, so, so if, if any of you fancy a trip to Ireland, then mm. that is going to be on. We haven't got the actual dates yet, but it is going to be next September. Yeah. Uh, uh, there aren't any so, uh, yeah. uh, details up anywhere, so uh, don't go looking on websites and stuff uh, for it. No, we'll, we'll tell you when. Um, mm. But we are going back next year. Okay. I think it's time to get uh, any more housekeeping you can think of. Uh, any more? <sighs> I can't think of anything immediately. Um, okay. We've got a little bit of time to catch up. Yeah, indeed. In that case, it's on to our first item, which, as ever, is pushing back the boundaries. Um, da, da, da. Uh, and mm. you found this one, didn't you, uh, Rupert? I think you found all these Indeed. Today. Um, yeah. uh, in, in fact, do you know what? It, this is an interesting one because, um, well, it's... Everything in Turkey is, well, not everything, but a, a huge amount of the news that comes out of Turkey. Uh, so much of it is about Gebekli Tepe. Um, <coughs> there's a lot of stuff about Karahan Tepe and uh, what have you. But you just get this succession of things that they found the oldest this, they found the oldest that. And in actual fact, a lot of the sites get very confused, even when you're reading the reports. Um, because they're finding so many different things that you get pictures of one place that are actually somewhere else. Mm. Um, but the, the reason we've uh, put this one in is they've actually found... Uh, so Gebekli Tepe is in... Um, uh, Salaf, uh, Salaf, oh, come on, Soskin, what's the name of the province? It's in Salafa, Salafa province some, some deal, some deal tell us it's, it's yeah. something yes um these buildings these latest buildings have actually been discovered in mardin province and they're thirteen thousand years old mm. uh which is just staggering and the thing is they are they're really sophisticated um uh you know it, it's a style of building that uh you know it's like so many of these things that you don't arrive at that you know you just look look at the complexity of that of that structure you don't arrive at that unless you've been building for quite a few generations i would suggest so you know so although they've dated these to 13,000 years ago we don't really know how how far back these um uh, you know the, the, this civilization or this culture, I can't call it a civilization, but how far back this culture actually goes, we have no idea. And they just yeah. keep finding more and more stuff. The interesting thing about this particular site is that uh, they, uh, it's, it's uh, Bonkuklu um, Tala is, is related to it, which actually translates as the beaded field. And they have found thousands <clears throat> of beads. Uh, around here, which are um, uh, they are carved or yeah. designed with animals and all sorts of designs. Uh, and again, when you when you think of the dates that we're looking at, I mean the the, yeah. the beads they're suggesting don't go quite as far back as these buildings, but nevertheless, you're talking about a level of culture which is hugely advanced yeah. for anything that we've known about uh, previously. So it's just yeah. an ongoing watch I this I, space. It's I thought Bangkok Lutala was the name of the actual site, or it's, is that not the uh, uh, name? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, site? it's, um, uh, hang on a second, I've got some notes in front of me, but... Um, uh, yes, it's the overall site, is Bangkok Lutala. Um, yeah. 
yeah. but this is so this is in as i said this is in mardin province which is about 150 miles roughly 150 miles 200 and something kilometers from gebekli tepe if it gives you a frame of reference it's about 150 yeah. miles to the east of gebekli tepe i don't know tepe. if we mentioned this you know stretch in years it it, it means that it's at least a thousand years older than Ge gebekli yeah. tepe yeah uh, a thousand years uh, yeah. So that's the... so. Lord knows what else is going to come out of uh, of the excavations <laughs> over there. There's so much work being done in Turkey. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, I think days, the, I mean. the the further back these things go, and the f further back you find these kinds of uh, buildings, uh, which uh, they are interpreting as settlements. Although, like Gebekli Tepe, they do have special buildings within them. It seems mm. Um, mm. that uh, we're still. You know, we're still hunting for the evidence of the transition between a hunter-gatherer existence and you know. Mm. Uh, uh, and, well, the particularly and interesting thing about these, um, yeah, yeah. But the particularly interesting thing about these structures is that uh, there are no signs of them having been houses. There's none of the signs of people living within them. Um, mm. So they're being interpreted. <laughs> as always, a lot of them are being interpreted as temples because everybody interprets everything as a temple. But um, but mm. a lot of the archaeologists are actually calling them, at the very least, they're public buildings. Um, yeah. You know, they would have served a function for the society, but they were not mm. houses. Now I've got uh, two which, other slides. You know, is interesting. I've got two other slides um, lined up, which we can't really judge the provenance of. We think it's from sites nearby but not quite as old as um mm -hmm. uh, so there is some confusion about which site is is where and what's dated to that well so the just, one you so show that, yeah, okay now you see that i think is uh, is carahan tepe no it's now not. i might be uh, no, okay you not. know that's wrong okay. yeah well i'll just shut up while you uh while you show some well no no pictures. that's 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 the point you know that you often yeah. you come across these pictures uh, so where do you do, think that one is I don't know where sure? it is. That, uh, that's the thing. I certainly that, don't know where that is. That's what is. I'm complaining about, the clarity. Ah, but if you yeah. look back at this picture, don't know, look yeah. at the four, four um, orthostats there. Yes. And there, you, see, you can see the square building. That is that four. building, yeah. Yeah, exactly. You would say. Yeah. So there's a, um, what my point is not that I know where this is, but there's a heck of a lot going on in this area that isn't just confined yeah. to um, um, yeah. uh, um, um, Bangkok uh, Tyler. Yeah, that was mm. all uh, yeah. I was going to throw in there. What I'm saying is if you do a search for Bon Cochlear Tower, there's a lot of other stuff that will come up and it, and you'll yes. come away thinking, I'm not quite sure what's going on there. <laughs> yeah, I think so at, at some point, um, yeah, we haven't talked about this uh, widely, but at some point we'll be going over there. And when we do, I think it'll be quite useful for us to get a series of not just stills but we'll do some film as well so that we can actually make some sense of what some of these sites are because they do seem to be confused yeah uh, I mean, in terms of what the public actually sees but, you know. yeah just to reiterate what i said further it says that this is a key finding that could shed light on questions like how people in northern mesopotamia and upper tigris uh, began to settle down how transition from the hunter gatherers life to food production took place or how the cultural and religious structures were escaped so uh, i believe that Shaped was a quote you. from the lead archaeologist on on that ergul kodesh mm. um i think that's all we got isn't it yeah i mean as as ever with turkey it's a watch this space it's just you know how could you how could you yeah. not mention oh, 13, a little caveat on, a little caveat on that i mean th this is not brand new that that this site has been known about for quite some time so it's the dating that's new here because yeah. the last news that came out was uh, that they'd found some eleven and a half thousand roughly year old buildings and they've just pushed these dates back and also the 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 bead finding aspect is uh you know i mean it's it's staggering what they're finding so yeah. yeah, as ever, watch this space. We will bring you more news when it's available. Okay, and talking of news, um, that mm. is where we move on to the news. Um, 
Before we start the news, I suppose this is a... <clears throat> a um, uh, this is news. Of course it's news. It happened yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> what happened was um, I spent a day at the Blick Mead archaeological site, um, actually on the dig there. I was so privileged um, to uh, get along there, actually courtesy of... Um, uh, of Kevin, Kevin Murray. I don't know if he's here, who's one of our patrons, that uh, attended a lecture by um, David Jakes, who's the lead archaeologist at, uh, at Blick Mead. Uh, and, um, uh, yeah, I, anyway, for, I got to go on the dig um, for a day, and my video has frozen. How about that? Hold on a second. <laughs> Uh, Text working the, well tonight. Yeah, excellent. I shall uh, <laughs> let's see if this works. Yes, it does. Takes us away from that uh, ugly photograph. Um, but <laughs> that is actually the Blick Mead dig, and that's pretty much that's pretty much uh, how it. Um, that's pretty much how it looked yesterday. Actually, um, the, Blick, the important thing about uh, the Blick. Mead site is that it's a Mesolithic site, and I don't know if you uh, let's have a look. That's where it is. Now, if you just take a moment to get your bearings, you see over to the uh, left there is the actual Stonehenge, the actual monument, um, uh, underscored by that wavy line, which is the A303. Uh, the the conurbation down to the left there is Amesbury, uh, as in Amesbury Archer. And the red dot is where this dig is. Now, uh, it is inside the uh, Stonehenge uh, World Heritage Area. <clears throat> but it is not a Neolithic site. It is a Mesolithic site. Uh, and the dating uh, of it, you know, they've been going through the layers here. And the datings here, you know, from 8,000 BC to 6,000 uh, BC and and beyond, um, and the it's the intensity of activity that has been going on uh, down uh, in this. Um, uh, I've come back and my video has still frozen. Uh, <clears throat> I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to switch off my camera and turn it on again. It's always a good first. Uh, don't so you love it when the tech difference. works and you've <laughs> caught me in the act of trying to do something else at the same time <clears throat> uh, pay, atten <clears throat> pay attention Soski, you never know what you might miss <laughs> <clears throat> uh, anyway. Nigel said did you mention the tunnel or did you get away with it <laughs> that's, a, that's a brilliant question that is a brilliant question. We did briefly talk about the tunnel, um, but uh, I know how passionate um, uh, they are down there because, you know, they're working within just a very, very few yards of the A303 um, uh, rushing past. And as I'm speaking, I'm trying to uh, reconnect um, the mains into my switcher device here. And let's see if that's uh, fixed it. I say, folks, it's a, it's a good job I know what I'm doing. That doesn't seem to have fixed it at all. Okay. No, it doesn't. <clears throat> um, I'll uh, tell well, you what. We like it that the tech works. But, yes, go and show us some more pictures. Um, I will. Uh, now, I was there... Um, I spent the day uh, sifting through um, stuff. What happens is, on a dig like this, you get lots and lots of earth, lots and lots of mud put, put in buckets. Uh, and the process is, you know, if uh, things don't necessarily get found under the trowel, um, but the trick is to, uh, is to sift that mud that's come through. And I spent uh, my whole day with my hands in water sifting through um, uh, mud. The, these buckets come through one at a time, get put into uh, uh, the, uh, the sieves, um, and so we can filter out and feel out uh, any artefacts, anything useful that may be in there. And I tell you, I kid you not, uh, that 
trayful, those trayfuls there, you know, represent. Put it this way, that would be a half decent museum e exhibition. And I promise you, I saw as much of that come out of the buckets, come out of the sieves, just in one day from this site. Uh, and even through my own hands, this is what it was uh, such a, a privilege uh, for these things to be coming um, out of the mud into my hands. Some beautiful, beautifully made um, uh, bladelets uh, and, and small blades, microliths. Uh, with exquisite detail worked, that it it, it takes a, an eye to be able to discern, you know, what's actually going on. I've come back, but I'm slow. But never mind, it'll it'll do for the moment. Maybe if it it'll catch up with itself the next time. Oh, it's not just you. I'm I'm slow as well now. So uh, okay, uh, figures, chaps. Yes. Uh, we'll we'll <coughs> mussing. Uh, uh, well, Andy says, wow, so they're working flint at Blickmeat. Uh, big time. Uh, you, you've got to understand that, that, that those layers represent so many thousand years. But not only that, but the animals passing through. You've got so much going on. There's a deliberately made path. Mm. That's why they know, you know that it, this place was special. A deliberately made platform, which is just near the spring, just near the, the, the pond uh, there. Uh, and you've got aurochs coming down there. There's, you know, there's, uh, looking at yeah. that uh, uh, down at the into the trench yesterday, there were several aurochs prints. As I was as I was there in the afternoon, an aurochs bone came out of the mm. uh, earth right in front of my eyes. Um, it's mm. absolutely <laughs> staggering, and no wonder they're I'll passionate tell you what, about what, it down there. <clears throat> Absolutely. Well, I'll tell you what's so astonishing about it, it really, for me, is that how many years have they been digging at uh, Blickmead? Oh, uh, well, they've known about it. Uh, the, the, the number 15 or thereabouts sort of comes into my uh, that, mind. That's the thing. Here's have, a statistic. Been, they... here's, here's the thing. In 2017, I read an article that was dated 2017. And at that point, um, they'd taken out of the ground 35 thousand flint implements mm. you know worked implements Thirty-five thousand. yeah i mean but you I, think that, honest, that honestly been digging there I, for that I, length of time and they're still finding that amount of stuff yeah you know you found that much stuff in a day it's in in four or five hours work i found 10 i found 10 yeah. it's insane yeah um I just have to say, I think, I mean, I've talked enough uh, uh, about it. Uh, if you've not heard of Blick Me before, please go and uh, and find out what you can uh, uh, about it. It is uh, it's fascinating. Um, but I'll, I'll leave it there for the moment and leave your own you know fascination to uh, to find out more. Just worth commenting on this, though. Ab Abby Sue's just asked, is the Blickmead dig happening because of a particular development happening? No. No. <clears throat> no uh, it's it's just an ongoing archaeological dig that the they whole, keep finding stuff, so they keep looking. The whole thing is ridiculously serendipitous because I think David mm. Jakes was responsible for finding it uh, uh, in, in the first place, and it was just something to do with something becoming available in the abbey grounds and it was speculative that the search for stuff was speculative anyway and it wasn't based on the idea that there were mesolithic finds to be had it was something else entirely my memory is vague on, on that um but it, it, it's and uh, there's another site just over the other side of Vespasian's camp, which is part of the Blickmead thing, which is uncovering a Neolithic settlement now, would you believe? And I had the privilege of being able to look into that as well yesterday. Got post holes there. And uh, the amount, uh, amount of Neolithic flint coming out of that site. Crazy. Crazy. Mm. Ne and I said to the guys there, I said, a Neolithic settlement? Wow, that's rare. <laughs> we talk about this, don't we, mm. Rupert, the rarity of 
We do indeed. Kind of stuff. Yeah. All right. Sorry, I've witted for too, far too long on that. Um, I don't think so. Not uh, no apology necessary. Yeah. I'm just going to say hello to Lachlan and um, uh, and also uh, Carrie asks, have we covered this site in any previous recordings? No, no we, we haven't, haven't. actually. Um, that was rather the point of me going uh, down there. I really wanted to yeah. get my hands dirty down um, there so we could uh, say stuff about it at a later date without it being uh, you know, yeah. too at arms. <laughs> <laughs> too far a distance and also um mm. you know establish good relationships with david jakes down there so hopefully we'll be uh, having him in I, I did ask him and we will be uh, getting him on at, uh, uh, as soon as we can probably have to wait until after the next stonehenge tunnel decision is made because he is also very much uh, involved in the against camp on the other side he's a leading force in that in the against the tunnel camp okay yes. I'm going to move on to, I think this is yours, isn't it? Uh, um, no, no, this this is still you because you stuck in Blick Mead quite uh, wonderfully. So, uh... <laughs> Okay, well, this is a uh, find uh, at the town of uh, Magny. I think Ma Magny, I think that uh, is probably my best guess at the pronunciation of that. Where in the world is that? It is... Uh, not far west of uh, Budapest, as far as I can uh, make out from this. And that um, This is simply um, what appears to be... Uh, it's, it's, the f it's the find in a Bronze Age burial. Um, they were digging. They were expecting medieval and Middle Age uh, stuff, but they came across some Bronze Age burials. But amongst them... Uh, what seems to have been the burial of uh, a young 20-year-old, um, if not wealthy herself, then uh, belonging to a pretty wealthy family because uh, included in her burial was an extraordinary uh, amount of, um, um, is it gold? Certainly uh, gold, um, about 38 bronze and uh, Gold decorative uh, object, objects. She's got neck torques, rings, um, epaulets, would you believe? Uh, hair rings, uh, and uh, some. I mean, well, that gives you an idea. Those are some of the things mm. uh, actually in situ uh, in the burial. So the, I think this is quite a fresh uh, find, and this is coming to the news. Um, uh, uh, you know, before it's really been um, analysed and reported upon. So uh, I can't, unfortunately, give you pictures of these objects. I think the, there is one picture, but it's, this has just come out, obviously just come out of the earth, so it's probably not a, giving a proper re representation of what it might look like um, when it's been cleaned up and, and maybe restored a bit. Um, uh, I think what the reason that they're getting excited about this is not just finding a, a burial like this, but because of the intensity, the number of artifacts found that would have been attached to clothing, that they're getting excited uh, about the ability to perhaps reconstruct her clothing. Now, yeah. when I say Bronze Age, uh, we're in Hungary, so it's a, gonna be, this is going to date it a bit earlier than it would be Bronze Age in, in Britain. Not a huge amount, um, but it's still, you know, not... I've got to mention Stonehenge. You know, it's going to be around about that time. <laughs> if, if a bit far yeah. So the ability to <clears throat> um, uh, uh, reconstruct, reimagine uh, from... Uh, so much adornment, what the structure of her clothes w was at those times, it's, it's quite extraordinary. Yeah. Um, so she was buried with uh, rings on each finger. Um, uh, they think she had pretty high social status. Um, and what's going to happen, um, that all this stuff is going to go uh, to the museum to be cleaned up and this this being relatively recent, it's one of these, uh, watch this space. Hopefully, there'll be some sort of press release, you know, when they've got things cleaned up and they can show this uh, stuff off. Mm. So, yeah. 
<coughs> Excuse me. I think that's all I've got for this. Oh, look, my video seems to be <coughs> caught up. Woo yes, it's working. Yes. Shall I do a dance? Um, <coughs> and for me, for me, the interesting thing about that news piece is um, that it's it, it's such a uh, a lavish uh, burial for someone that young. Mm. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I mean that's it. I, I'm not making any other comment than that. It's uh, it's going to be very interesting to see, uh, you know, what the rest of the excavation reveals. Anyway, yes, one second, uh, please. Should we move on? Yes. Hi, Kevin. Get well soon, mate. Sorry, missed you yesterday. Carry on, <laughs> Kevin. Yeah, get well, Kevin. Um, yeah, should we move on? Yep. Yes, this is exciting. Uh, uh, I have to confess to a fair degree of stupidity when I read this because, uh, as you can see, this is uh, uh, from the Negev Desert in Israel. And it had never actually occurred to me before reading <clears throat> this uh, piece. <clears throat> that Down there on the right, yeah. If, you, if, you're, if you're smelting uh, or extracting any ore, uh, any metal ores from rocks, <clears throat> the amount of charcoal you need. It had never occurred to me. And what this research is, it's um, a, a team of archaeologists have been excavating. Uh, it's a site known as Slaves Hill in the Timna Valley. And yeah. so it dates from 3,000 years ago. And so the, at there the time, are actual a, archaeologists actually doing it in the... They um, are. Yes. yes. And look, that, let, look that, we there's like an archaeologist lady doing exactly what what I was doing yesterday, <laughs> but in the desert. <laughs> yes. Yes. Doing I what can't I was doing for with a no that water. You were anything like anything like that dusty? Wait. <laughs> no, no. I was I was covered. <laughs> Filthy I was yesterday. Oh dear. Sorry. But, carry on. Um, anyway, that's that's all right. Shut up. The. Uh, <laughs> So the thing is that 3,000 years ago, this site was a, a really important um, centre of copper production. And what the study found was that over a 240-year period, it actually degenerated uh, uh, into uh, just smaller and smaller, poorer and poorer production because they'd used up all the good wood from the immediate vicinity, uh, which was, uh, I've got all my notes, so I have Luddite notes, look, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, that was predominantly white broom and acacia. I'm pleased to see this then. <laughs> well done. And, uh, that, that made the, uh, the best charcoal. And what happened was, <clears throat> as they uh, progressively, obviously, def you know, deforested, they used up all the vegetation, and they were getting getting further and further afield mm. to find wood and it was wood of poorer quality they ended up using palm trees which don't burn with anything like the same uh, heat they're too soft and fibrous and what have you and and so the site was actually abandoned because of the inability to uh, uh, to get a uh, good charcoal and mm. it remained <clears throat> abandoned for a full thousand years until the Romans came back because the Romans, of course, imported their own wood. Um, so it all kicked off again a thousand years later with the uh, with the Romans bringing uh, uh, wood with them. Uh, mm. But that... Um, but the significance, uh, Rupert, a... is mm. that we never think about things this way around. It is that no. the, the ecological impact of you know going into the copper age going into the, the, the bronze age mm. and beyond as we know look you know simples mm. look at that oh it's a beautiful picture I like, yeah. like that picture but to produce a you know a, a, an ounce or two of of copper you're using a hell of a lot of wood charcoal yeah. to, to do it you forget about that yeah. aspect of it that this monster must be fed and it'll yeah. produce these droplets of uh, uh, of copper in the end. Um, uh, you know that uh, that's... picture there. Not much copper will come out of those those pots. Not much at all. But that's what I was saying, though. Call me stupid, but you know we have talked so many times. All right, not in not in depth, but we we have certainly mentioned 
many, many times over the years uh, about the levels of deforestation uh, in prehistory. And I have to be honest, I have never even one single time thought, yeah. oh, that's because they're making charcoal f <laughs> f for um, metal production. Never mm -hmm. even occurred to me. Um, uh, it's interesting. You know, we need to throw that uh, sort of information at people like James Dilly and see if it's something that is just, you know, he might think Some we're completely radio. stupid for not yeah. thinking of it. But um... I'm conscious that our dear guest, uh, Duncan, is waiting in, in the green room. and uh, Is he? We, yes. And, and we did say, you know, sort of. 25 half past and it's 22 now so we just need well, to in that case we should we should pull him in because we have to uh, again got to be honest uh duncan can't stay with us too long he uh, he has places to be people to see uh, that is right so i sh what i shall do i shall uh, i shall race along and uh where am i hold on there we go so i'm a bit out of order here then for a second so i will go to that screen and say it is now time to chat with our guest. Uh, and today our guest is Professor Duncan Garrow, Professor in later prehistoric archaeology at Reading University. But you may know him from such um, blockbusters as Rasmussen's... Oh, no, that's not... <laughs> You may know him from such blockbusters as Seaways and Shared Ways, imagining and, re -ima and imagining the movement of people, objects and ideas over the course of the Mesolithic Neolithic transition 5000 to 3500 BC. Stepping stones to the Neolithic, radiocarbon dating the early Neolithic <clears throat> on islands within the western seaways of Britain. Covering the dead in later prehistoric Britain, exclu uh, elusive objects and powerful technologies of funerary performance, grave goods, objects and death in later prehistoric Britain. And you're not going to go through all his papers, surely? No, no, that's, by no means is that all. <laughs> I'm just scraping the surface here. Neolithic culinary tra traditions revealed by cereal milk and meat lipids in pottery from Scottish crowns. And just look to bang the gong just a little bit more before we get it, get him on. Not forgetting this. Yeah. Which is the World of Stonehenge exhibition uh, book that came out of that look. Is that? Where's, yes, oh Duncan God, had a lot to do, do with that. Yeah. Well, Duncan off, you know, wrote it with Nigel. Yeah. There we go. Anyway, enough wittery. Enough. Of, enough of that. Uh, <laughs> uh, right. Do beg your pardon. Let me add you to. Oh no. Uh, da, da, da. Guess two and. Oh, it worked oh, before. Oh. It did. It did. Here we go. Hey. <laughs> Sorry hey. to take so much time, Duncan. Uh, hello, that's all. Right. Uh, good to <laughs> good see. To hear it's good to see you. Good to hear the highlights of Duncan Carrow's output. <laughs> I'm sure, everyone enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, I compiled that before I realised we were going to get behind. But I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, welcome to the show. Welcome to the Thank show. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so uh, the reason when were, you, when were you last on, Gar uh, Duncan? I can't remember when you were last on. It was. I think I was on. I did a thing at Callanish, didn't I, last summer? Oh, yeah, that's that right. Was yeah, part so it's of like a year. A year but I was year properly ago. talking yeah. to you in lockdown, so it must have been twenty twenty or something like that. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's long so, overdue. It's good to have you back. It is, so. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I just you know, you know what? Got so a... little time and so many questions. Yeah. Um, crack on. I don't know. Crack on. Yeah, where should we start? All right, well, look, um, uh, some of you know, uh, but uh, Duncan uh, uh, Duncan does a huge amount of work unravelling what we do and don't know about Cranags. Duncan, tell everybody uh, who might not know what a Cranag is. So a Cranog is um, really a, an artificial or at least a partly artificial island, so an island that people have made. Um, with archaeology on it, sometimes buildings, sometimes other mysterious practices like the ones that we're trying to unravel. So, yeah, simply a, an artificial island, mm -hmm. mainly in Scotland and Ireland. So that's their kind of, it's kind of like a Gallic word. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Because, yeah. uh, I mean, it's just so exciting what's been 
coming up in your research, quite literally what's been coming up in your research yeah. over the last couple of years, because because you've you've recently refocused, haven't you? Because you were um, up on Lewis mostly, weren't you? And now you're down in Uist, uh, yeah. so yeah. south in the Hebrides, basically. That, that's um, right, yeah. So go on, t tell, us, uh, tell us what's been coming up in your yeah. recent stuff. So, um, so we, we, Chris Murray and Mark Elliott, um, pe people that live in Lewis, had found lots of Neolithic crannogs, and we've been investigating them and digging one of the main ones last summer. Um, and we wanted to know whether the the this crannogs of Neolithic dates so around about three thousand five hundred to three thousand BC um, were all over the Outer Hebrides, and we're also interested in whether they're in mainland Scotland as well, but that's a different story. Um, so we thought we'd better go and have a look. Um, and so we we went to North Uist, Ben Becula, and South Uist, um, and we dived in around about 35 Cranog sites. So they were known sites, it's just that we didn't know what date they were. Um, so we donned our dry suits and jumped in a lot of lochs over the summer what fun. Um, and ha had a very wonderful time. So it was great. Yeah. So uh, we we have to ask you um, about the culinary stuff, because that, that's what's so exciting, I think, about the, the yeah. latest stuff you've been finding out. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, we never got round to. I, I don't think putting that because uh, sort of we're out of step with ourselves on a month-wide basis, and we never got round to uh, doing a thing about what's been coming out of um, yeah uh, the residues inside some of the pots that you've been yeah. uh, coming up with and um, yeah yeah. So that's been that's been really exciting stuff and. Um, that's work that's been led by our colleagues in, in Bristol, um, mm. Lucy Cramp and Simon Haman. Um, and they, um, and they're, the, they're the scientists. We just find the stuff and then they, they do all this technical <laughs> stuff, which I, I agree is quite important to find the stuff. But <laughs> Lucy and Simon have all the, the magic to find stuff out from it. Yeah. Um, and, and, and they've been, what, what's really exciting about what they've done so they, uh, Lucy actually approached um, me because um, they were after waterlogged pottery. And obviously all of our pottery has been coming out of loch, so it's very much waterlogged because they thought that would be the best place for the preservation of this new, um, um, the, of the, the, the chemistry that they need to detect cereals. So for a long time we, we've been able to detect um, animal lipids, so the the fats that you get from milk or or meat that's been cooked in pots. But Simon and Lucy were were trialing a new methodology that allowed them to look for cereals um, using similar techniques, and that's what they wanted: water materials. And they they were really happy with what they got out of our pots um, because they the, the cereal biomarkers were brilliantly preserved, basically. Um, so that was fantastic. So they've been able to demonstrate that people were um, cooking and eating um, wheat, um, which is a for the world of Neolithic archaeology in Scotland is quite a revelation because um, because mostly it's barley. Yeah. Um, so that was a, um, in in the actual seeds. Yeah. Um, so that was really cool. Um, and the other good thing that they can do, the really clever thing that, that I really like, because it's kind of what you want to know about the, the Neolithic is kind of recipes in the food. So we don't just want to know, yeah, they ate wheat, but we want to know, okay, they were mixing wheat with milk. And, and so the, the story that's run is that this is really ancient Scottish porridge, which I quite like, yeah. um, because it is they were seemingly mixing up um, kind of gruel or porridge using the cereals. Mm -hmm. um, but they've also been able to show that um, they had meat in the larger pots and the cereal and, and stuff in the smaller pots. So they've been able to get not only at the foods that they were combining in the Neolithic, but also the kind of vessels that they ate them from. And it really brings the, your understanding to a bit more of a nice fine detail that's quite, that's quite personalised, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
That's, That's really interesting. Because you really yeah. wouldn't expect, you know, a crano, you know, which is submerged most of the most of the time. You really wouldn't expect to go looking there for these kind of riches, would you? In the first place, it's just no, counterintuitive. Absolutely. And it's it's amazing, you know, the ones in in Lewis in particular have just had so much pottery um, thrown into the locks around them. And as you, I think you hinted earlier, maybe it's about feasting and that kind of thing going on on those sites. Mm -hmm. um, but we're getting into a little bit of insight into the kind of foods they might have been eating at those feasts and and that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. So it's, it's really pushing the boundaries of of archaeological science, which is really exciting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Does it, have you does it, um have, have you got any um further insights into uh you know, are, are, are these ritualized or you know are we getting any sense of the actual usage of the uh, of the islands? Yeah, it's, a, it's the eternal question that I'm never very mm. good at answering, and I'm not sure anyone is. <laughs> <laughs> and I tell you what, um, I've now looked at quite a lot of Krenogs. Um I feel like I've done my time. Um, because we did look at a lot this summer, really a lot. And it was a really amazing experience to be able to look at so many of those sites. Um, and you came away from having looked at, at 35 or, or, or so sites, even more puzzled than when you started. Um, right. and, and, and it's really fascinating to, um, to dive around them because sometimes you can't see anything because it's really deep mud and it's you yeah. understand it, but you can't but some of them are really perfect visibility and it's just sand on the bottom of the loch and so you can imagine that stuff would have been you know lying there all that time and sometimes we we found stuff and we found some more neolithic sites well you've but found extraordinary time, stuff i mean there's that almost yeah. iconic picture that gets used so many times of the Unston where um, yeah pop, yeah that know, was Chris, in <laughs> Chris's hand. Yeah, not Chris yours. is too good at finding things like that and he's a good photographer as well <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but we we can almost you know we can almost replicate that exactly but um yeah but um and uh so and but some some of these sites have no material at all around them and oh, you just no. you're swimming there and thinking what were they doing with these sites? Then, if this, they're building a stone island with a causeway out to it. Sometimes two in one lock, really close together, mm. and there's no material. So, was it some kind of, you know, special religious site or burial site? And that's one of the things we're wondering about at the moment because we've got burning on the site we've been excavating. So maybe it's possibly about cremation or something like that but we need to, some firmer evidence before we can start saying that kind of thing for certain so we'll see yeah yeah really interesting that's really interesting I, I i don't know if i should be tossing this one at you but you mentioned burning and it's something that um uh, mike and i comment on quite a bit uh in th there's a lot of talk in archaeology about ritual burning of this that, and the other uh, but we make the point uh, a lot that um yeah, but we are talking at about a time in history when people were lighting their wooden houses with naked flames. What could possibly yeah. go wrong? Um, yeah. And and so it's when you know you, it, it's these things are often interpreted as ritual burnings, but they could just as easily have been accidental burnings. Uh, you know, how would you tell? Absolutely, yeah, and and I don't think we can tell on our our, our site yet, um, but mm. we can see very clearly that very it goes. It's it's peat, um, burnt peat. So and it's interesting. It goes really bright pink. So you you definitely know it's burnt. You know you're there, mm. and then you're in the normal browns peaty soils, and then there's this really amazing bright pink layer, and you're like, I think that's burning. <laughs> amazing. So, um, but yeah. we'll see. Maybe next we're going back to Lewis to dig at, at that site next summer. So with a bit of luck, we'll find out more. Right. Hopefully. Yeah. Uh, brilliant. For anybody that's uh, new to Cranogs, uh, I hope that's a wonderful, uh, but uh, brief, albeit brief, but uh, a great introduction because um, they are a, a gift that obviously is giving, whether it continues to give, we shall yeah, get, continue oh, to I watch uh, this space. Yeah. Uh, it, it, yeah. Um, but we're, we're aware that your time is limited tonight. Uh, yeah, Duncan. sorry to run off so, and see my sister. That's quite, quite <laughs> No, it's great to see right. you. Uh, really uh, um, uh, well, uh, uh, good luck with the ongoing anyway, and uh, yeah. uh, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get you on again soon when uh, when time is not so pressed. 
we'll yeah. stay in touch and let you we'll, know what riches we find here. Yeah. We'll Excellent. get into the long weeds then. We'll get into the long seaweeds then. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that thanks was bad. for having me on. Bad. Yeah. <laughs> oh, pleasure. Uh, thank you so much, Tony. It's good to see you. Bye. Yeah. Cheers, bye Tony. Take care. Bye. 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 <coughs> Excellent. Me. <clears throat> Excellent. Thank you, uh, Excellent. Thank you, Duncan. Um, it's, um, uh, there's a comment from Andy there, quite right, Andy. He says, let's not assume they weren't multi use. Absolutely. Um, and uh, yep. Yep. You know, any number yeah. of buildings could have been, yeah. We yeah. always like to say it's a yeah. thing. Um, yeah. Anyway, where was I? Uh, I was going to say some mention something terribly important. Oh, terribly important! I tell you, it's really, really important. I've got to say a huge, huge thank you to a uh, uh, Pixie piano player who has um, made themselves our number one fan. Oh, the, thank you, Pixie! Uh, through, through the gift of uh, of super chat, yay! Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Much, much appreciated. Cool. Oh. Uh, Literally, where was I? I was just about to move on to the last. Should we, uh, should we do this and a sort of a quick wrap up before we move on to the? Oh, he's done Come it again. What, Pixie? Are you? Uh... No, it look, I thought it looked like uh, Pixie Piano Maker had um, made another donation. Uh, I'm really confused. It, 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 do you know what? It's wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I'll press this button here. And that will remind me what I'm supposed to be doing next. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, this is the tail end of uh, our uh, newsy thing. And these are 11, the 11,000 year old mount, ceremonial mounds, uh, apparently are the oldest known uh, human made structures in North America. Where are we talking about? Let me just press some buttons simultaneously because I can. <clears throat> We're looking at the mounds that are on the uh, um, uh, in, in, at uh, Louisiana State University. Um, I mean, that is what they look like. Um, maybe a familiar sight to some, not so uh, to others. Um, but what we're looking at is uh, two six-meter, 20-foot-high mounds on the campus of the Louisiana State University. Uh, and it is the, recently it is being claimed that these are the oldest human-made structures ever discovered in North America. Um, now there are, uh, there are a heck of a lot of uh, human-made hill-like mounds in Lu Lu Louisiana um, built by ancient indigenous people. Um, quite a few actually have been destroyed, but obviously these two do survive. Um, they're able to date these because excavations have got down to uh, the earlier levels. Uh, and, of course, we're apparently right near the bottom of the layers of ash uh, from burnt reed and cane plants um, were discovered in the cores of one of the mounds. Um, a radiocarbon dating of the layers indicates the mounds were built, um, uh, as I say, uh, 11,000 um, years ago. Um, but not only that, but they were used over a huge range of time. Now the... Um, where am I? Let me get back to... Uh, oh, that's handy. Is it every time I do that, it does something different? <laughs> do you know about <laughs> enough about this to, to take over here, Rupert, while my video sorts itself out by any chance? Uh, no, no, but uh, it's <clears throat> interesting. Kate's made a comment here that she says that the archaeologists uh, here uh, don't agree with that. They say it was dug I by was... a geologist, not an archaeologist. Um, <clears throat> interesting with so many of these uh, findings that when they're when they're ah. hot off the press, then there's uh, arguments to be had. Do you know what? Um, I but... I kind of uh, I I kind of uh, I'm so sorry. I'll just put that pi uh, picture up again, um, hey, so we can wait uh, over that. Um, it's live TV. 
<laughs> and I wish I could get to the bottom of uh, what's uh, causing it. Uh, yes, interesting. The, the paper is by Professor Emeritus Brooks Elwood. Uh, Professor Emeritus Brooks Elwood, I should say. Um, and he's at the Department of Geology and Geophysics. So it doesn't mm. sound like he is uh, an archaeologist. That doesn't make him wrong, though. It doesn't make him wrong. Uh, no, of course not. Um, but you wonder, you know, what the uh, uh, argument is. Now, uh, uh, Kate said, uh, Kat says um, uh, most mounds are only 1,000 to 1,500 years old. Um, and I, to be honest, you know, we're in a, an area here where, uh, I, you know, we are relatively ignorant as far as uh, North American archaeology is concerned. So, you know, we're f mm -hmm. fishing in the dark. But if the uh, carbon dates are to be believed, then we're talking about a range of dates. Um, and they've been able to establish that over time, uh, that the uh, mounds were abandoned uh, and then rebuilt. At the first, there was only one of them, uh, <laughs> Mound B, strangely enough. Um, <clears throat> the way they've been named, the Mound B seems to be uh, the older one. And around 8,200 years ago, um, the southern Mound B was abandoned. Uh, tree roots found in the 8,200-year-old sediment layer indicate that Mound was not used for about 1,000 years. And also around 8,200 years ago, the Northern Hemisphere experienced a major climate event with temperatures suddenly dropping on average about 35 degrees Fahrenheit, and that lasted 160 years. It's not known why they were abandoned uh, at that time, uh, but their mm. environment changed suddenly, which may, may have affected um, uh, many aspects of their life. Then what happened 7,500 7, years ago, the indigenous people began to build a, a new mound just to the north of the first mound. Um, mm. But th this time it was mud from the floodplain. Um, uh, so it was a, it's an <laughs> entirely different construction. It's you know just interesting that it's right next door <laughs> to, uh, to this one. Um, so, uh, and uh, Mound A was gradually built up and completed about 6,000 years ago. Um, and, mm. uh, you know, there's another interesting thing that they say that the, um, they're aligned to, uh, the, to the Arcturus, the giant star Arcturus. Uh, but how do you really? align mounds? I mean, with... You need, I, I, I don't get that bit. Well, uh, <clears throat> no, I, the, <clears throat> uh, because it's that thing of, you know, a line is always going to point to something, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to give you, so you at, can... least, uh, at least so the good folks have got something to, interesting to look at. Uh, at, least, uh, at least you've got your happy smiling face <laughs> to look at. Maybe, but... I have been called many things. <laughs> um <laughs> No, it is an interesting one, though, and, uh, you know, obviously uh, included here because it's in the news. And uh, and uh, as with all these things, you know, we'll bring you more news uh, when it's updated. So mm. it, it's a very interesting thing, uh, you, you know, when archaeologists argue with geologists and the other way around. Uh, and one of the finest examples of that is Giza, of course, where archaeologists and Egyptologists give you a, a date of the pyramids and the Sphinx, you know, 5,000 years old, what have you. Uh, whereas the geologists have been saying for decades, and I do mean decades, they've been saying, but hold on, there's rain erosion on the Sphinx, and there hasn't been that much rain in the Nile Delta for 10,000 years. So it's got to be at least that old, if not older. And uh, geologist Robert Shock. Uh, American geologist Robert Schock, uh, he showed as well that there's some repair work on uh, the uh, on the rump, if I can call it the rump of the Sphinx, uh, and the repair work is the age that they say the Sphinx was actually built. Well, you know, uh, you'd think that repair work, you know, on a on a stone uh, thing uh, is going to be quite a long time after it was actually built so these arguments always go on uh, between archaeologists and geologists uh, the interesting thing as archaeology moves forward 
is that it's it's moving so quickly now it's moving from having been a purely interpretive discipline into a, a, a science that has all sorts of laboratory techniques for measuring exactitudes. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, it's interesting uh, to see how all these things will progress uh, as the years romp forwards. Uh, and so, yeah, I look forward to uh, uh, hearing what they say about the Louisiana mounds as... Uh, you know, the, the Louisiana you so Mound Society, I don't even know if they're still around, are they? Thank you so much, uh, Rupert, for holding the space there. I've been frantically <laughs> unplugging things and pulling plugs out and it's been blind. And here you are, you're moving again. I am moving again. <laughs> oh, thank goodness for that. Anyway, it's time to move on to our main subject. Uh, and um, hopefully you're all with us. Yes, excellent. Still people in... Uh, uh, in the chat, um, yeah. So uh, yeah, you saw our little um, com compilation of our whistle stop to our ten day tour. You're absolutely right. I did miss a couple of things out, and I don't know how that happened. Nevertheless, not important. Um, so we went on a tour of uh, Ireland, um, and. Uh, Oh, I tell you what. <laughs> My connection what? to the other computer's gone, so we don't have any slides. There we go. <laughs> uh, live TV. Oh, sweet, eh? Uh, right. Uh, anyway, uh, the point is, yeah, we'll, we can do this through the power of words alone, Rupert. Um, uh, yeah. We came back from um, Ireland pretty much with our minds blown on, in many ways uh, from that because it was an enormous eye-opener. Uh, we weren't too sure. We didn't know a vast amount about uh, the Irish sites and, and uh, uh, their relationship uh, to uh, prehistory generally in the, the British Isles. When I say the British Isles, you know what I mean, the... <clears throat> The British archipelago, I shouldn't call it British even, should I? No, I'm getting myself and I'm digging myself into deeper water. I'll stop now. Um, but uh, how it, it all integrates and, and fits together. Um, but there was more underneath the carpet than we realised when we started lifting the corner uh, of it. Um, how would you like to frame this and, and leap into it, uh, Rupert? What sort of started... Uh, alerting us what is the main thing that has uh, alerted us to something and feeds it, it, it this is the thing it feeds into our thinking anyway it's another yeah. uh, complexion of the way we think about ancient sites uh, a lot of the yes. time when it's appropriate when it's appropriate yeah, yeah. It, it's been a very um uh difficult thing this because uh you know i put my grouchy hat on quite a lot um, and criticize archaeologists very freely when I think they're making uh, assumptions that they shouldn't be making and what have you. And I found myself in a situation with Ireland where, um, or I, I say I, um, because I'll put my hand up to, you know, uh, ready guilt, but I should probably say we, um, uh, that the Irish mythology just points a finger or many fingers in the directions that we think it should point. But we have to be very careful because it's mythology and you, you can't then say, oh, look, the mythology says this, so it must be true. Mm. Uh, all you can do is say, well, the mythology says this, which certainly doesn't contradict what our mm. theories might be. Now, a lot of you already know that we've been looking for years now we've been looking at um particularly henges but uh enclosures palisaded enclosures causewayed enclosures and we've interpreted them as places for uh it's managing livestock where uh, you know and it, it could be you know as, as some of you will have seen in standing with stones that we put forward some of these places as arenas <laughs> 
uh, a, you know, like a precursor to a, 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 the Colosseum, if you like, you know, that these would have been places for games um, and henges as places to keep your livestock and protect your livestock. And then you find in the Irish mythology, which granted the mythology wasn't written down until the medieval time, but this was handed down through oral tradition. So we don't actually know how far back it goes, but there are hints that it goes back at least to the Bronze Age. And the thing is that in Irish mythology, there is a word for cattle raids. It's just a word. Um, now, if, if something has a name, it's a noun, uh, so it doesn't require an adjective. It, it is a word. Well, it means, well, that must be very common in, uh, you know, in your culture if there's a noun for it. So people were cattle raiding all the time. And what better way to protect your cattle than a henge? <laughs> you know, if you've got a massive ditch and a bank, then yeah. people can't just, uh, you know, run in and stampede yeah. your cattle away. Um, we're not saying, uh, so, we're, yeah, uh, we're not saying, you know, when we're making use of uh, mythology in this way, we're not saying, for example, that the Tambo Colonia, or Colonia or the, the cattle raid of Cooley refers to events going on in the Neolithic. Um, traditionally, it's thought at least that it probably <clears throat> refers to events going on in the late Iron Age, um, but it's it's not quite the point. What it speaks to is a mindset and a sort of cultural thing that if you've got cattle, then this is going on. And mm. you've got to be thinking in that way about protecting your cattle, if human beings mm. being human beings. The fact that we've got these wonderful, huge, epic tales about a cattle raids speaks to something deep-seated yeah. and... Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah. If if we're uh, in the absence of the other camera, I'll show you this because I know that Mike's oh, no, going to show the, you this. The other camera is here. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. In that case, I won't hold the book up. Um, <laughs> well done. <laughs> so that illustration uh, shows now in the in the that that ring uh, yeah, that all those lines converge upon. Uh, that's Rathcrogan, which is uh, in uh, in myth, that is the seat of Queen Maeve. And all those radiating lines refer to cattle raids that all went back to Rathcrogan. Uh, now, that's in the mythology. Uh, all of those cattle we're raids. Talking, <laughs> exactly. And we're talking about long-range cattle raiding here. It's not yeah. just going to your neighbour. This is yeah. organized big mm. stuff that uh, takes a small army of people to carry out. <clears throat> uh, uh, yeah, so it, it, it's, it's a really interesting hint that, that these stories, uh, Barry's just asked, you're speculating some mythology is a depiction of a collective memory. Um, if you like, I wouldn't call it a collective memory. I would yeah. call it, uh, you know, um, if, if something has come down through oral tradition, then not, uh, not then some. Would... You know, let's clarify that a bit. We're not saying that the events actually took place the way that described. Mm. Um, we uh, uh, ignore oral tradition or the results of uh, oral tradition at our peril. I think, but we've got to t still take it with enormous pinch of salt. <clears throat> It's not so much that, it's the cultural indications of the way of thinking, not about mm. what actually happened that's important here. And, mm. and whether or not you know, they are true, it just gives us another window to look through when we're looking at large uh, enclosures of whatever sort in the landscape, ditched enclosures, henges, uh, palisaded enclosures, you name it. I, it. I think that explaining it this way is we've never thought in terms of protection when we've been looking at these these things before. Now, having 
Well, yeah, well I have, I have, I have, but oh, not with people. Uh, in, in fact, I, I've said many times, and, 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 and on the back of this, I now feel completely stupid that, you know, I, I've, I've, said, um, I've said before, you know, let's not forget that this was a time in history when there were still packs of, uh, of, of wolves uh, roaming the countryside yep, yep. and bears and lynx and what have you. Never occurred to me that it would have been your neighbour come to nick your cattle. There's Didn't even think about it. Yeah. It's just, a, like I say, it's just another way of looking things. It's a, it's a, it's a, <laughs> such a useful light to shine. Uh, and we haven't begun to shine it yet, uh, I, I think. No. So the thing is, uh, is, is no knowing what this little leverage point um, may um, reveal, uh, may unearth uh, for us, you know, looking at places mm. in this way. I think one of the most significant things here, you, you know, as Mike's saying, you know, regardless of whether the, the stories themselves are true, one of the things that is utterly unavoidable is that there is a word for cattle raiding and you can't escape the fact that if, if this practice is a noun, then it's something that is deep rooted in culture. It's, mm. it's normality almost. Mm. Uh, that can't be ignored. I'm going to read you. Um, this is something that was written by a chap called William Wilde a couple of hundred years ago. Uh, uh, I can't tell you where he was getting this from. But he wrote, reporting on something else from longer ago, um, it was not unusual to bleed a whole herd of cattle upon a May morning and then to dry and burn the blood. We have more than once seen the entire of the great fort of Rathcrogan, that's Queen Maeve's seat, um, uh, uh, then the centre of one of the most extensive and fertile grazing districts of Connaught, literally reddened with the blood thus drawn upon a May morning. Bleeding the cattle at this period was obviously done with a sanitary intention, but choosing that particular day and subsequently burning the blood were evidently vestiges of some heathen rite, particularly during hard times. Some of the blood thus drawn used to be mixed with meal, boiled into a, into a posset, and eaten by the herds and the poor people. So basically it's the precursor to black pudding. But... Um, <laughs> Uh, but, you know, there again, you see, you have it here that, that a site that uh, if you talk to the archaeologists and the historians, they will tell you that these sites are, uh, whether it's uh, uh, kingly, you know, the seats of kings or... Uh, or, or temples or ceremonial centres. But here it says, uh, the entire great fort of Rathcrogan, uh, then the centre of one of the most extensive and fertile grazing districts of Connaught, literally reddened with the blood. Uh, you know, it's mm. uh, these sites are so steeped in animals. I basically. have to say it advertises itself merely as a guidebook. Um, but this is an it's astonishing um, uh, little uh, book that uh, it's got so much archaeology in and a lot of the mythology in as well about a, a site in Ireland that is so important. Yet it seems not that many people seem know about it. No, uh, even no. even we uh, we came across it by serendipity because we couldn't go to one site we thought we were going to, and we sort of something. Oh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Looked around frantically. Yeah. Oh, there's something, yeah. Rathcrogan. Let's, let's... Go there. We did know about uh, it before, but it, it, it didn't sort of register on the Richter scale no. that much. And having been there, we're going. Oh my God! Yeah. Who knew? Uh, uh, <clears throat> and, and the crazy thing is that um, because of researching all the animal-based stuff over the last years, uh, I've done a reasonable amount of reading on uh, on uh, some of the Irish sites and, again, feel stupid that Ruth Crogan had passed me by. I mean, yeah. you know, Navan Fort and all sorts of others, but no, missed, missed this one. So 
There you go. Um, I, I will say, as an add-on to all of this, that uh, we we wanted to get um, Anthony Murphy on. Did we say this before? We wanted no. to get Anthony Murphy on today, but unfortunately, he was um, he was otherwise engaged. Um, and uh, we will, though. Anthony would love to come on, so we, we're going to get him on for a, a, another show, and and we'll talk some more about. Uh, what we can extract from uh, the mythology. Yeah, because Anthony is such an expert on the mythology. Not only that, but he <clears throat> lives but a few miles from Brune the Bogne, Newgrange, mm -hmm. Nauth and Dauth. Uh, and his study, um, he, while, you know, he will call, I would call him a mythologist, but he too, even... Uh, um, <clears throat> Put it this way, his researchers have uh, managed to intertwine a lot of the archaeology and certainly a lot of the local folklore. We're not talking about the <clears throat> myths that were actually written down in the 12th century uh, based on oral tradition, um, but an extraordinary amount of work was done in, was it the 1930s? I can't remember, was, or was it even earlier? where um, local folklore in Ireland was researched and archived. So I can't think of anywhere else in the world that has quite such a record of, its, um, of, it, uh, of the existing folklore, you know, uh, rural fo folklore. And it, what Anthony has found is the astonishing correlation of some of the detail in the mythology with the folklore and with the facts on the ground. I can't, you know, at this moment speak to a particular example. That's why we need Anthony here. But it's the, it's the what seems to be the depth of connection of folklore and myth with something in the deeper past that has a say there's more meat to this than you would you would think otherwise, seeing as we're dealing with myth, which tends to get um, swept aside. Mm. That, I think that that was the point. I think that's the last point we need to make. So it's. A, I, I want to pick up on a comment, actually. Um, please do. <laughs> Angvar has, has said, precursor of the black pudding. It demonstrates that you British people have been eating disgusting things for millennia. <laughs> <laughs> You speak wise words, Angra. <laughs> it's the only time I have black pudding is when we're out on tour and it's on the menu. Yeah, for, I won't uh, touch it. The, I will uh, not touch uh, the stuff. It for is breakfast. vile. Uh, it is well, vile. Some, is, some isn't. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Anyway, we've digressed a, a, a bit there. Um, so it seems... Um, uh, are, are we are we done with that for the moment? I think we've expressed what we need to express, and I think we've honoured the question. You know, we asked that we we will yeah. continue to ask the question: mm. Can mm. Uh, Irish Irish mythology teach us anything? You know, is it is it useful to us? And <coughs> yeah. at the same time, being very wary and very careful about you know, because uh, we all like stories to add up and, and make sense and. And describe mm. stuff that we, you know, we've got in in the archaeology, mm. uh, and some people are at great pains to make the mythology real, and we mustn't fall into that thing. If it works, good. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But hopefully, it will continue to teach something us something as we learn more and more. That's about it, I think, Rupert. And I think mm. with that, it is on to uh, the last thing before we leave you and I don't think that um, the uh, the PowerPoint is connecting still so I don't know if it's any worth me trying to do this at all let's have a look no nothing there <laughs> <laughs> we were going to mention a bit of whimsy before we went that was all uh, yeah we were yeah. Uh, and in fact uh, yeah we will I had a um, I had a couple of pictures of pots I was going to show you but I can't Oh, oh, yeah, that's that true. It. Yeah, you did have pictures of pots. Yeah, damn it. Um, uh, no, this is uh, uh, this is something that we we actually uh, we talked about this. 
heavens. Um, uh, it was some years ago, and the it's truth 2019, is that, I think uh, it must be. Oh no, I'm thinking about something else. Uh, Carry on. No, it won't. <laughs> I'm thinking about something else. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, oh, but pardon me, God, the tech is really being wonderful tonight. Uh, here we go. Um, uh, so <laughs> the funny thing about this, uh, just uh, I'll keep it brief. Uh, but uh, th this was forget King Alfred uh, going down in history for burning cakes. Uh, this is uh, in a place in uh, in Denmark called Silkeborg, and uh, archaeologists uh, they unearthed a completely undamaged Bronze Age clay pot, and it was uh, it, it was in a strange place. It was outside where the the excavated, you know, what would have been the the house where it would have been. This was outside. And inside the pot, there was this strange looking kind of cindery substance. And uh, so quite keen to find out what it was, uh, they, uh, they took it to the lab for analysis. And <laughs> basically, it was burnt cheese. And uh, <laughs> so... Burnt to a crisp, obviously. So uh, number one, the uh, the the oldest Look, known cooking I found a fail picture on the internet. In the there world, there it is. Have, oh, have you? Have you? Oh, well done. That's that's the pot. <clears throat> now, well done. Um, it gets funnier because uh, when they did the full analysis of uh, uh, of what this stuff was. Uh, it turned out that it had actually been uh, the way the cheese had been made and cooked, uh, that it was in a type of acid that doesn't come in cow's milk. They think it comes, uh, they think it came from the cow's stomach, where the bacteria in the cow's stomach would create these kinds of, of, uh, of fatty acids. Uh, and so they they think that somebody was probably experimenting <laughs> with cooking the cheese, and just ended up creating something that number one stank to high heaven, and number two was just belching out thick acrid smoke that was uh, that was just being disgusting. So they, they must have just taken the whole thing outside <laughs> and just dumped it out on the grass. To uh, to save themselves from choking to death, so that's three thousand years ago. Cooking fail made me laugh. There you go. <laughs> but but it's not just the, it's the imagined drama. You know the imagined dr domestic drama. You know, kind of oh god, what's yeah. that smell? <laughs> did you did you leave that pot on? Oh god! Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, oh, it's just wonderful. And the fact that you, you have to feel sorry for them because it's, you know, back in the day, you know, it, it's not like you could have just uh, popped down the local <laughs> shop to buy a new pot. That would have been a ruination of a good pot. But... <laughs> Jenny, Jenny Coffey says, my early relatives. <laughs> oh, dear, dear. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff probably. <clears throat> uh, anyway, with that. I think we've come to the end of the lollipop. And so, the end of the lollipop. The end of the lollipop. Um, mm. Well, well, I hope it's been a good one, folks. Um, Despite the glitches. Yes, yes. Tech's been weird tonight, hasn't it? It's um, yeah, unusual mind. too. Never mind. We got through. Uh, we we did, uh, guys. Can't thank you enough for uh, watching and, and sticking with us and um, uh, being such a good audience and playing nicely uh, amongst yourselves in the in the chat. Sorry, we haven't had a much more chance to uh, delve into the and chat and see what you're doing. Thanks for those that have contributed. Um, thanks for those. For those of you, if you're looking at joining us on on Patreon or supporting us in uh, any other ways. Quickly, before we go, we've got two minutes, you know, or whatever to do this. So it must be con concise. As you know, every month we've been doing a monthly Q&A in the past. And it's just to let you know very briefly that what we're going to do in future is break it down a bit. 
We're going to take individual questions from you, uh, from people that are on Patreon and uh, others that, that come in as well. <coughs> the first questions will be from Patreon uh, supporters, and th thereafter we'll, in, in, uh, we'll canvas and invite other questions in. But we're going to do individual shows answering, answering individual questions. So if you want to take part in that and have your question answered, um, yes, uh, give a bit of context for your question, but the rule is it must be uh, less than 100 characters, so it forms the uh, title of the episode, the YouTube episode, the YouTube show. Okay. I'm not going to stretch out and give any more detail, um, but the second thing is, and this is a watch this space thing, uh, Rupert and I have decided to throw our cap over the wall and uh, start um, uh, pre-production, start organising, start uh, preparing for a series of uh, travelogues that we're going to call The Road to Stonehenge. And the intention is to start in Turkey or, you know, over there with Gebekli Tepe, Katlhoyuk, you name it, um, then go up the Danube, <clears throat> about stuff in uh, up there and then across the Mediterranean trade up round to Brittany then take it across the channel into Britain by the time we get to the Neolithic in Britain and the, uh, the thousand and or so years between the arrival of the farmers and the building of Stonehenge that in the form of probably a five part uh, travelogue that Rupert and I will undertake and hopefully take you with us um, on this journey of discovery of the Neolithic, of the farmer movement from east to west. Did I describe that about right? Admirably. Obviously, Admirably. We, will, I, we will be asking for support to do this via both channels. And Candide, thank you so much. We oh have my a super goodness. sticker. Thank you, Candide, very, very much. Hippo character with pink hat flaps back. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, brilliant. So that, in a nutshell, is, is we haven't got stuff in place for people to start um, supporting us for that. Um, I think it'll be a Kickstarter campaign. If you're impatient and you want to throw money in that pot, anything going to our um, uh, Buy Me A Coffee campaign, link below, will go into that uh, production pot. But in the fullness of time, we will be putting up a, a full Kickstarter campaign to produce this series of films. That's mm. it. Okay. Uh, um, Angva asked the question, did you say this? I can't remember. Uh, where can we write the questions for the Q&A? He says... Uh, As I say, the first questions we'll take from from Patreon, um, uh, people are on, on Patreon. Then after the first one, it'll be leaving uh, leaving your question in the comments section of the of the last um, uh, Q and A, if you see what I mean, uh, of the last show. That's the way to do it. If 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 uh, hmm. if you want to get your question in now, you're afraid you have to um, go over to. Uh, um, uh, and join Patreon, um, but we expect the first show out to be within the week. Thereafter, it'll be we'll be inviting uh, questions into the comment section of of those shows, if that makes sense. Um, mm. All right. Uh, I didn't. And one more uh, comment that I want to pick up on. Spike uh, says, "I'm going to look into how long it would take to build a henge." Uh, I will uh, point you towards, if, if you can get hold of a copy of the excavation reports for the Devil's Quoits at Stanton Harcourt, um, uh, then there is so much calculation in there of how long uh, it would have taken to build that henge. They've calculated man hours. So, mm. uh, you know, so if you had this many people, it would take this long doing blah. Huge amount of calculation has gone How on. How easy that. is that report uh, to get were... hold of, Rupert? Hold on one sec. Oh, you've, you've got it there. Uh, but... um, just so that you know what you're looking for, uh, that's. Uh, 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 
Yeah, there you go. it's probably... Um, and it's not easy to get hold of, but have a look on Amazon. You should be able it's to find it. It's probably not uh, cheap as well. I think there's uh, also some stuff in Mike Pitt's Henge world. I'm... Uh, there probably is, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Where's that then? Oh. oh, it's right over there. Uh, yeah, sorry, I can't reach for that right now. <laughs> That's what my version looks like. Oh, well done. <laughs> <laughs> no, it probably, uh, whoops, sorry. It probably looks different now. I I've mean, it's an excellent back. read anyway. It really is a, a fabulous uh, read, uh, Hengewell, anyway. Mm. Okay. I think we've said all we need to say right now. Mm. Um, thank, mm. uh, I've done all the thank yous. Uh, we look yes. forward to seeing you all again and maybe a few more of you on, on Patreon. That would be really, really great. So that's it. Wrap up now. Uh, till the next yeah. time. Bye-bye from me. Yeah. And bye-bye from me. And thanks again. And we'll see you next time. I'm going to press the outro button now.